the, the cobalt mining thing, it's like, why is no one really talking about that? Why are people still using that same old trope that diamonds are unethical when there's been so much done and there's been nothing done about all these different aspects of trade and manufacture? Uh, learn how to be a diamond grader, I've got qualifications in gemology. And the most recent thing I did, I went to Antwerp for about um, four months and became an optical diamond setter. Wow. What everybody usually does, what everyone does now, is they'll just go online and they'll Google like diamond buying advice and it will come up with four C's. And the four C's are color, cut, clarity, and carrot. Now, they all refer to the quality of the diamond. And they don't really refer to the opt well, they don't refer to the optical properties of diamond at all. Oh, okay, so imagine like 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve, pretty smashed already, <laughs> and said, I really like this ring, I want to propose to my girlfriend over Christmas. I don't know if she's gonna say yes or not. I was fine. Well, I said, if, is that we reopen on the 2nd of January? She says, no, we'll give you money back. 2nd of, Jan- 2nd of January came in. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video if you enjoy it and please subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying our content. Today's guest is Robert Robbins. Robert, how are you, mate? Very well. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on, mate. It's all right. So today's a little bit of an unusual one. Um, once in a while, men decide they want a ball in chain fitted and a prerequisite <laughs> to achieving that is sometimes buying an engagement ring. Um, so I hear you know a little bit about that sort of stuff, mate. I do, yeah. I've been um, doing this for about 24, 25 years now. Okay. Uh, started when I was 14, um, working in family business. Basically, I wasn't allowed to leave. So <laughs> Forced there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I did, I did leave for a couple of years, but... That's uh, another story. Yeah, okay. But that was still in the jewellery world, though. Yeah, okay. So you've been a jeweller for a while. A little while. And uh, what sort of uh, stuff do you specialise in? So if I give a bit of background mm. to how I got to where I am. Started off um, just as an apprentice, like, you know, didn't know what to do with my life. Um, still don't, really. But um, working in the shop, you know, um, trying to get any time at the bench I could, you know, just tinkering about, just have a go. Started to really enjoy it, thought, don't really want to go to uni, waste all my time there, um, come out with a big load of debt and nothing to show for it. So I um, stayed in the business and I started um, learning repairs, like the repair side of stuff. So that's what the business really used to focus on. That's you know where, how it opened, just doing repairs. Um, from that, I went on to um, learn how to m- make individual pieces of jewellery and uh, you know, and then learn, and you learn more and more as you go. Obviously, um, went away, learned a couple of other things. Um, uh, learned how to be a diamond grader. I've got qualifications in gemology. And the most recent thing I did, I went to Antwerp for about um, four months and became an optical diamond setter. Um, and learned under the, um, well, arguably one of the best people in the world. So that has enabled me now to specialise in bespoke jewellery. I still do repairs and restorations, but the big thing I do now is just all bespoke. And the big one is bespoke engagement rings. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, good. So you know a bit then? A little bit. All right, perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if, if a bloke then wants to buy an engagement ring, what, what are the kind of general rules that they should be thinking about when buying one? I would say, firstly, make sure whoever you're going to give the ring to is going to say yes. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, a bit em- embarrassing. Otherwise, <laughs> that has happened. Do you give refunds? <laughs> We do actually. Have you ever had that? Yeah. Have you had that? Yeah. She yeah. said, no, mate, can I return it? Oh, yeah. Mate. No yeah. fucking way. Imagine with, that. Reef yeah. with a hug. Imagine that, though. Guy came in like 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve, pretty smashed already, and said, I really like this ring. I want to propose to my girlfriend over Christmas. I don't know if she's going to say yes or not. I was fine. Well, I said, if, is that we reopen on the 2nd of January? She says, no, we'll give you money back. 2nd of January. Second of January came in. Well, there's a bit of a caveat to it. She said no, but she said no because um, she wasn't ready yet. No, so, no, is it? Fucking no, is no. Never saw him again. <laughs> Fucking hell, that is brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine you said no. He can't have your money back, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably well, well within your rights to, in fairness. But um, yeah, I don't, we've never been like that anyway. Yeah, it but it's either. like thirty days. You get to exchange or refund something as long as it's like unworn in the original pack- packaging you've got the receipt but I had like a gentleman's agreement with him so 
That is fucking, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, that. yeah. Well, I've got some great stories about things like that, about people bringing in previous, like, ex's engagement rings. Oh, yeah. And they just want it, like, polished up so it looks like brand new and they give it to the new one. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. way. Yeah, no, but, you know, you, you know, one guy in particular, um, <laughs> he... Uh, he basically said, like, oh, well, I want to get it remounted in something new. Um, you know, and he was like, oh, maybe I should sell the diamonds, bad karma or whatever. Yeah. And I said, like, look, mate, so to be honest, this ring that you've got is actually really nice. So you sell that, you're not going to get as much for it, and you're not going to be able to buy something as good for your new partner. So I was yeah. like, you know, maybe just get it redesigned or something. And he was like, that's bad juju, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, it's up to you, mate. I was like, just, that's a, that's a big thing with me. Like, I'm all about, like, making sure someone makes the right decision for them. You know, like budget, design, you know, it's got to be right for them. You know, I don't I don't care if we want to spend like 100 quid or 10 grand. Like, I'll give you the same service. I'll give you the same advice, you know. But yeah, so back to general rules. <laughs> um, first one is actually set a budget. So it's much easier to walk into a jeweler's and say, I've got this I want to spend. Um, what can I get for it? And then obviously, like, you know, we can work with those people because it's not just as simple as, oh, go online, you know, read about the four C's of diamonds. You guys familiar with that? No. Okay, so we'll backpedal a little we're, bit. We're fucking clueless, mate. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, so this is the thing, right? So you guys are perfect candidates, really, to have this conversation with because loads of blokes like it. And in the jewellery industry, we're really, really bad at marketing engagement rings. So you would think you would market an engagement ring towards a woman who's going to wear it. Actually, you should be marketing it marketing towards men because they're the ones that buy them and when you're buying an engagement ring typically you're not going to go and ask a load of people about where they got theirs or you know because it's a secret isn't it mm. you don't want people to find out what you're doing and a lot of the time someone says like you know as soon as you, a secret's not a secret is it as soon as you tell one person that's it it's no longer a secret and they'll mm. go oh yeah but they won't tell anyone and it goes on and on before you know it everyone just tells one person don't they yeah the mother-in-law finds out she drops it to the fiance or to be fiance and is ruined what's going on guys this episode is sponsored by eden clinic for men who specialize in men's health and male hormones the details are on the screen now and in the description below head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test select edp which is the everyday perspective to get yourself a discount in addition to male hormones such as testosterone these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on fellas, so get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. So what everybody usually does, what everyone does now is they'll just go online and they'll Google like diamond buying advice and it will come up with four C's. And the four C's are color, cut, clarity, and carrot. Now, they all refer to the quality of the diamond. And they don't really refer to the, opt well, they don't refer to the optical properties of diamond at all. So I've actually got um, an image I can show you, which will, will help with um, explaining this. So you would think, right, let me show you this picture. Right, okay. So that there is just an image of two diamonds that are magnified, mm -hmm. right? Can you see a difference between them? Yeah. So what would you say the difference is? Um, this one looks like it has more kind of color to it so it's got this bit in the middle there yeah yeah it looks darker yeah yeah so yep. it looks like there's more fragments to it if that makes sense yeah exactly so probably what you're seeing is let me turn this layer on all those red circles are inclusions now that will refer to its clarity grading in particular right the reason why i pulled these two images is because both of these stones have diamond reports with them 
that give you the four C's, okay? The diamond report says that both of these stones are in um, the same color and the same clarity, right? I mean, obviously you can tell that they're different. Mm. So they would, they would come through as the same quality? The report would come through with the same grading on it, okay? So the grading for these was E color, uh, SI2 clarity. So if I just quickly go through basically what that means. So color in a diamond, um, so everything in a diamond is referred to as how pure it is, okay? So a, a colorless diamond, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, the diamond's white. It's not really. The diamond should be colorless, like glass. That starts at D, okay? So the highest, most colorless grade is a D, okay? The reason they did that is because if for some reason they found something that was more colorless, then they could go to a C. There's a genuine reason, right? And D for diamond, right? Then the clarity grades go from flawless, which is no imperfections on the outside or the in or the inside, then to internally flawless, no imperfections on the inside, and then you drop down through these gradings, yeah. right? It goes VVS, VS, SI, and then um, they call it piquet or included, which means you can see inclusions with the naked eye. Now, uh, diamond is graded under 10 times magnification, all right? So those were blown up to more than 10 times, so I could illustrate to you um, basically why you shouldn't just go off of a diamond report. Because you'll look at the report, and this is a thing we classically see as well, right? So you guys will go online, well, not maybe not you in particular, but guys will typically go online, they read a bit the four C's, and they'll go, right, I want the best color, and I want the best clarity, and I want a one carat, okay? That's gonna be insanely expensive because they're rare, okay? Because that means the diamond is super pure. So uh, something that would change its color. So what makes a diamond go yellow is like a nitrogen um, imperfection, like a molecule, like atoms, like nitrogen. It makes it go a bit yellow, okay? There's other things that, you know, um, affect the color, different impurities. So it's just, that's this class as another impurity. But because the diamond is graded at 10 times magnification, the clarity grading works by the largest uh, inclusion at 10 times. So you could have like, well, like that stone, you could have 10 SI inclusions inside the diamond, or you can have one. So what happens is people will say, and again, that doesn't at all account for optical properties of the diamond. So a diamond will fluoresce. Some diamonds will fluoresce under UV lights. Going to a nightclub, some diamonds will glow. Sometimes what that can do is it, it can make a diamond look quite like, we we'll refer to it as like milky. So it looks like it's, it looks like you could give it a wipe and something would come off the surface, but it doesn't. It's, it's like an optical property of the stone. So you could get a really high color, really high clarity stone, and it will look terrible in comparison to a lower color, lower clarity stone. So this is basically a long way of me getting around to saying, don't just buy a diamond report. Like, don't just go online, look at the four C's, think, okay, I know what the best is now. That's what I need you'll get like, people get like really hung up on that. Mm. And then they can potentially order a diamond through from online. And this happens a lot. And they'll look at it and they'll think, oh, well, happy with that. Cause it looks like it's cheap, but then it'll come through and then they'll, you know, get it made up into a ring or it comes and made into a ring and they'll put it next to, you know, someone else's engagement ring and they'll go, well, mine is supposed to be a better color and a better clarity and better everything, mm. but it doesn't look as good. And sometimes this fluorescence gives it that weird milky effect. And there's lots of other things that can dampen down like the luster and really affect a diamond's um, optical property. You know, and that's the whole thing. You want it to sparkle, you want it to look right. And a lot of um, what isn't accounted for is how the diamond's cut. Um, if you get a stone that's cut badly, it will just look terrible. So what happens is, you know, people go online, get the colors and cuts and decide, you know, what they want. And then they'll, you know, you know, they'll never compare the stones next to each other. So what we do for people and what, you know, a lot of other people do is they'll say, okay, what's your budget? Again, most important thing, get a budget. What's your budget? And they'll say X amount, okay? 
And you go, right, okay. And then you get in a selection of diamonds. It may be no more than three. Um, slightly different sizes, slightly different colors and clarities. And you go, okay, what do you like out of that? What do you think is the best? Because to be honest, like my dad always had this thing. He was like, you, no one need, no one, you know, really needs to, you know, become a diamond expert. Because if you see a good one next to a bad one, then you know straight away. And that's true. Mm. A lot of the stuff that goes online, so we deal with one of the, I think they are the biggest diamond supplier in Europe, actually. Um, and they refer to what they call rejection stock. So that would be stuff that comes through with these reports and they'll have poor optical properties. So they won't really look that good compared with other stones that do look that good. And it's a shame really because like the optical characteristic of a diamond, how much it shines, like it's brilliance, isn't part of the report. So all of those, they'll just put online to, you know, big online, um, well, you can just Google it to find out who they are. I don't want to name names. Um, and then those diamonds, you'll compare, say, like like one of those, an ESI2 diamond at like half a carat. You'll compare that price with maybe a price of a jeweler that, like, you know, like me that you walk into. And you'd be like, well, I'll get it online because it's cheaper. But it's cheaper because it's typically not as good. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the high street and I've got a dog in the fight. I'm saying that because over the last probably 10 years in particular, it is a weekly occurrence that we see mm. someone's bought something online and they're like, oh, that's not what it should be. Yeah. A lot of that is down to, so the report cards as well. So there's two big companies, there's GIA and IGI. I became a diamond grader with IGI. So basically what that means is I can look at a diamond and say that's, uh, G color, VS, clarity. Mm. Uh, the carrot is just how much it weighs. A lot of people used to think that carrot was, you know, the higher the carrot number, the better the quality. Mm. It's just a weight. It's just a, a, a weight reference. So I'm um, qualified to look at those now. And this is what I was saying earlier when we were chatting, uh, that the reports come in and I'll check the report against the actual physical diamond that we have. A lot of the time, they're not that accurate. I wrote an article about this. I think I sent it to you yeah. um, for an industry magazine. And the title was Dom Reports, Can We Trust Them? And the answer is no, essentially. So they, they were made to standardize diamond grading, essentially. And that did work for a long time. Then what happened is people within the industry, like in jewelers, retailers, they didn't really need the expertise that was acquired to check diamonds against the reports because they're like, oh, well, we don't need to send people away to do these courses now because we just buy the diamonds with these report cards and they say what they are. Over the last probably 20 years, um, people have been manipulating that system. So they'll send a diamond to, it's very well known, there's certain laboratories that they can send their stones to and they'll give them like a really, um, what's the word, favorable grading report. The problem with it is that the, the misconception is that the certificates, and I have to um, you know, catch myself all the time because I sometimes mistakenly refer them to, in the end work, I'll say, oh, can someone pass me the diamond sir? And it's not a certificate. A certificate attests a fact. A report is something which is like, you know, an opinion, it's someone's personal opinion. So if I grade a diamond and I say it's a GSI2, you could grade the diamond and say, I think that's a H, so one lower, right? And then you could grade it as well. And you could say, I think it's a H VS2, okay? So they're all really, really close to each other, right? Which is fair enough. That's like within the margin of error, you know, accounting for maybe different lighting in the room, you know, whether your eyes are good that day or not, et cetera. But we're, what we're seeing time and time again is a report will come through and it will say it's, um, so the lowest clarity it can be for it to be eye clean, which means you look at it just with your naked eye, can't see any inclusions. The lowest it can be is SI2, okay? So like those that I showed you just now. Now, if I showed you both of those, just loose here now, you wouldn't be seeing any inclusions, okay? 
what's happening is the uh, the SI2 grade is no longer really SI2 for a lot of people, you know, and that's like night and day. It's like you can either see an inclusion with the naked eye or you can't. There's no like debate between that, really. People are grading stuff as SI2 when really it should be included or PK, which is like the worst grade, which means you look at it and you see an inclusion, okay? Big problem with that is that there is a huge price difference between an SI2 stone and a PK stone. And if you... Oh, how much of a difference are you talking about? Like it can be as much as like 20%. Oh. Yeah. No, if you if you think like the average spend um, of an engagement ring is £2,000, 20% of that is significant. If you think there's people out there that spend way more, you know, that becomes exponentially mm. more significant, doesn't it? Yeah. And this is something that you'll never find out if you are buying a stone online because if you buy the report and it comes through you're not comparing it to anything you can't then say to the person in front of you oh why is it i can see an inclusion in that but i can't in that i think the big issue is blocks most blocks don't even know what that is no <laughs> do you know what i mean like if, if genuinely if i was if i was doing that bought one offline and i'd look at it as long as it looked okay i'd be like yeah yep yeah and to be honest that some part of that is fine yeah but the big part for me is that you've been taken advantage of yeah, yeah, 100%. that's the thing i like i'm that's what i'm all about like you know we'll get onto the lab grind diamonds thing in a minute um there's a place in the market for that but it, that is another big part of like you know people are being taken advantage of mm. because they're not being told the entire truth they're not being given all the information so what about chains like i don't know h samuels or high street chains yeah do they use the same sort of reports and, and maybe um like you know you i can look at a, 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 obviously if married when i was looking at engagement rings they look exactly the same size exact same thing they'll go ah oh, you said this this report well, yeah and it's a thousand pound difference and i'm like oh, don't even see a difference a cheaper one yeah <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean but do they do they do the same type of thing as online like you know what i mean like do they yeah, still buy in like the cheaper diamonds do they whereas you're local so then you you obviously use better diamonds I don't know if, that, if that's a thing you know like a chain, yeah. a chain in general always seems to like skim off the top like it's like they'll, yeah. they'll get the same ring won't they mass produced yeah so you if a diamond's different every time then you're never going to get the same quality of diamond but they charge the same amount of money is that yeah. a thing yeah is that a thing yeah. yeah you know what I'm saying yeah definitely so there's a big thing in manufacturing in general where you know high street jewelers in mm -hmm. particular they're all about profit margins when you know the price of gold went up in 2007 i mean it started creeping up slowly when um the iraq invasion happened mm. and then it went up pretty exponentially but do you know the the big recession northern rock crashed all that stuff yeah i remember that, yeah it's gone through the roof like literally overnight started going through the roof and um it's still really high from then it was commodity like Exactly, yeah. You know, anything unstable happens to the world, people invest it in, you know, in gold. gold. <laughs> yeah. So because of that price increase, what a lot of manufacturers did is instead of saying, well, we just need to increase the price of the product, they lowered the quality of the product but kept the price the same. So now you'll go and, you know, you might be able to see rings and you look inside the ring and inside of the shank is like, the shanks like you know the bit inside uh, where, the, where you wear it in the finger that'll be like hollowed out and the manufacturers may be saving half a gram but over 50,000 rings they're making a tremendous saving but that that hollowed out part that loss of half a gram to your piece of jewellery does not mean it's going to last very long it ends up becoming a really really low quality product now, in relation to the diamonds, they still they still use the standardized system of color and clarity and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But what they typically t tend to do is they don't they won't go through, say GIA for example. I mean, you can get them, but typically they'll have their own brand, their own like branded jewelry. Um, so in so GIA isn't a brand; it's a non profit organization that everyone's got access to to be able to buy the diamonds that have been you know you could just buy a loose diamond and send it to them and they do a report for you or a loose gemstone anything really but the 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 high street will usually brand something um and sell it as 
like their own product. Mm. Uh, that that makes it a lot easier for them to sell in mass. So then they'll, I mean, I don't know for sure, but typically they'll just sell like um, eye color SI diamonds across the board, which is like a lower quality, but still to look at, you know, it's pretty yeah, good. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, again, it all depends on what you're happy with when you see it. Mm. But again, I'd be, I've, you know, I've seen, because I still do lots of repairs, the quality of the jewelry I've seen and the quality of the diamonds that are in that jewelry compared to what it's been sold as is not really accurate. Everything in the jewelry industry is just like going down, 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 down. So on that, would because it's a manufactured by machine mm -hmm. compared to you, you hand make all your jewelry? Yeah, the majority yeah. of it, yeah. So does that mean that, is the, does, can you make it as perfect as someone that makes it in a machine? Yeah, great question. So you must have seen, well, maybe you haven't actually. I'm, I'm so naive to what other people think about <laughs> and, you know, how much experience I got with jewellery. Uh, you used to just be able to buy like a small selection of designs of engagement ring, right. for example, right? Enter 3D printing into the world. That got into jewellery and basically you can create something on a computer and then the 3D printer will print it in amazing detail, right? Much more so, much more detail than potentially you could make by hand in a cost-effective manner. I've seen some pieces of jewelry that you would think were made by a robot. They're so precise and so amazing, but they tend to be like 100 years old. There, There's people out there like me that are making good high quality pieces of jewelry, but for the average consumer to pay a highly skilled person to sit down and make a piece of jewellery which might take yeah. five days is outside of their budget I'm not talking about like just you know traditional engagement ring I'm talking about you know like big like diamond clusters or big pendants something like that you know machines will do it you know the 3D printing will do it really really fast so that enabled jewellers to expand their design range and still mass manufacture and make it cost effective bit of an issue with that is that all of it has to be cast. So do you know what lost wax casting process is? It's been around for about, I think the earliest they found evidence of it, it was about 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians would use it. And basically all it means is you make a shape in wax, put it into like a, you know, like a plaster of Paris mold, for example, you pull a plaster of Paris around, and that, then you burn it out from whatever way. So that's, typically how jewellery has been made for a long time as well. So they would use, they would, you would carve a ring in wax uh, or what people would typically do is they would make a master model in like a metal, usually silver. Then they would injection mold that into a wax and then the wax would go into this lost wax casting process. Okay, that very, very reliable way of doing things. The way 3D printers work is they use a resin and it's like a glue so it's like you you have a like a liquid bath in the in your printer and then it cures the glue through a uv light and then it builds the layers up and that's how it prints whatever it is you want made that does not burn out very well in the burnout process to create the void that you want to be able to pour your metal in you following me yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. because that doesn't burn out very well a lot of the time when the metal gets poured in you get problems. You'll get like impurities in the metal. The the casting won't come out properly, and uh, a lot of the time you get something called porosity. On mass manufacture, that is very often easily overlooked. Uh, you'll have like, and the other thing that they do with mass manufacture is they'll. So you, you must have seen like a ring that's got lots of diamonds set in it. Mm -hmm. So the way I do that is you drill the holes. You create the little claws and the beads that hold the diamonds in. When it's done on the computer, they just put that in automatically. And they call it, they call it like preset. So basically all you have to do is push stones in and push claw over. A lot of the time, um, because the metal hasn't been worked with, it's not very hard. The claws will break off very easily. You, know, you could wear it for a week or so, your diamond fall out. You know, all these things could go wrong with it. It's like anything. Anything you try to do, a lot of mass produced, like you are going to start cutting corners somewhere you know you can't have uh 
a high quality product that is also made fast and cheap. You know, I, I don't know if you can think of any examples, but I know it definitely doesn't exist in jewelry. Mm. It's just not something you can do. As a result of that technology coming in, that has also reduced the knowledge needed to know how to make a good piece of jewelry because you can make it on a computer and what you can make on a computer doesn't always work in real life. I was talking to, so I went on one of these design courses uh, to use uh, this design software, learn how it works. And I was sat next to a woman who had won a scholarship at a academy uh, in the UK uh, for, you know, making jewelry. Uh, and I thought, it was amazing. How did you, how did you win? She said, oh, I, you know, did this piece of jewelry. And she showed me a design. I looked at it and I was like, how did you make that piece go in there and how did you do this? And she went, oh, well, I never made it. I just, uh, I just designed it. And I was like, how have you won a scholarship? to like, you know, a prestigious academy and the people at the academy don't even understand that what you've designed can't be made in real life. Right, physically couldn't be made. Couldn't be made, yeah. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah. So it's like the people who are like at the highest levels of jewellery, like who are, you know, in education, teaching people, people that are doing the buying, that, you know, a lot of the knowledge is really, really poor. Mm. Like it, it pains me to say it a bit because it makes... I, I feel like people are going to look at me and go, oh, he just wants to be the big I am. And the thing is, is I've got, I've got a lot of experience across lots of different aspects of the jewellery trade. I've never really met anyone like me in the jewellery trade that's got such a wide range of You've grown experience. Up with them. You've grown up with it. Yeah, I've grown up with it. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Like how many people fucking grow up with their dad being yeah. a, a jeweller yeah. you know, and, and carrying that on? Yeah. And the other thing as well is how many people start something I mean, this is, a, you know, you could say the thing about uni. You go to uni for four years and you get a degree. And then typically the learning stops. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning now. Like I said, I've been 24 years. I'm still learning now. There's still much that I can learn. I mean, just through doing some of the research for this, I've learned even more. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've just tried to continuously do because I feel like if you're just going to do anything, you know, you might as well do it. Yeah. You know, be interested, be involved. Mm -hmm. And I've just carried that all the way through. So... I feel like I, I do have the confidence to say that I know manufacturer is poor in jewellery now because I was there 24 years ago when it was better. A, re a really humorous thing happened, actually. So people go on about, you know, um, Chinese manufacturer and all this sort of stuff, right? Uh, and it not being very good. 30 years ago or so, people started sending stuff over to China to be manufactured. And then the Chinese, like they are, amazing, got really, really good at it. <laughs> then loads of people back in the UK who had sacked all their stone setters, sacked all their goldsmiths, you know, got rid of them all. So, oh, we're getting it done really cheap in China. They were like, oh, we'll use it as a marketing tool to say it's all British made again. Like, and they come back and it's terrible. No way. Yeah, it's terrible because they've lost out on that 20 years of training people to you know and like passing down that knowledge mm. like what i do is like really really a dying trade so going right back to the, the original question the other oh, rules yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so really simply put if i wanted to go buy an engagement ring what are like the, the key key rules that i should be thinking about yeah key rules big ones just budget budget do you know what your partner wants mm -hmm. you've got to get some sort of advice yeah. somewhere you she know. pick mine well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Great. And that's not too uncommon, though. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the time, what people do is they we can just sell you a stone. Yeah. And other people who do that as well. You just come and buy the stone, then you come back, and then the, you go through a design process mm -hmm. with yeah. your partner, which can yeah. be quite good. Um, yeah, be wary of um, buying stuff online. Yeah. A uh, big thing that we've been doing is remaking engagement rings that were bought online. Yeah. Um, regardless of the, you know, the diamond or whatever it said it's supposed to be, the, you know, a lot of the time they come through and the stones are loose in mm -hmm. the setting, which is not yeah. great. And um, yeah, just go ask the questions, you know, that, you know, you've asked really. And, you know, go and ask them about how the four C's affect cost. Uh, ask if you can see a few different stones. Because the thing is, it, it, it is overwhelming. I mean, I'm so used to it and I can talk about it so freely. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like if you, if you want just like a few short bullet points, definitely... Just get a budget. Get a budget in mind, stick to it. Yeah, find out what she wants. Try and get some 
advice and find out who's had a good buying experience in the past mm-hmm. uh, and then maybe use those trying to find out who's got a good reputation um and a really a big one for me a big signifier of whether a jeweler is good or not and whether there's going to be a good base of knowledge there is just find out whether they've got an on-site workshop because if they've got an on-site workshop you'll get really good after sales as well mm-hmm. whereas high street jewelers you can go in and say oh i need my ring resized you've well, just got away. engaged yeah, get sent away talking like maybe six weeks before you see it again. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> no worries, yeah. better. Um, I wanted to ask about budget as well. And for growing up, it's I've always thought that like the, the standard rule of thumb was like three months salary on an engagement ring. Is that still a thing? You heard that before? Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard yeah. that. Yeah, that's the uh, the trope. That's the usual trope. To be honest, because you said the average earlier was about two k. Yeah, like so the, yeah, yeah. Is that a national average or for the UK? Or, yeah, is it okay? And that doesn't matter what the engagement ring is. Yeah, uh, you know, it could be a, a sapphire or a labyrinth mm-hmm. or whatever. Like it's typically around two k, okay. which is not insignificant. Yeah, but budget wise, yeah, I mean, like three months salary. Yeah. What a fucking money! I know. <laughs> I'm thinking, fuck that. What? <laughs> 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 fuck yeah, that's a what? piece of fucking what well, ring. Well, yeah, look, look, if you're me, it'd only be about six hundred quid. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask as well because obviously these days, I mean, you know, sort of weddings don't seem to be as much of a priority for people. Yeah, I mean, people seem to get more div- divorced more often as well. So you may see remarriages, I guess, which is going to help business. Yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously, traditionally speaking. Men were like the breadwinners. Mm. They're not all the money, so therefore they had a responsibility to buy this nice expensive jewel to put on a woman's finger. Obviously, these days, it's a lot more equal in regard to pay. Do you still yeah. see men coming in and buying a lot of, of, of engagement rings, or have you seen it dip, drop off in the last few years? Yeah, so I had a little look around to see what um, like the numbers were to do with marriages and, mm. and things like that. And there's definitely, there's, there's definitely been a decline in the 90s. I read that in the 90s, if you asked a guy over the age of 30, if he'd been married before he was either i think it was 70 percent were either married at the time or had been married mm. as opposed to 30 percent now mm. You're yeah That's a huge difference isn't it yeah. huge, huge difference huge difference uh marriages are down massively since covid but i, th- I think that's because it was a couple of years where people couldn't really you know get married mm. have i seen a decline or a change you know people buy rings probably not I think the biggest change I see now, and this was the thing that always used to uh, grind me a little bit, is guys would come in and they'd be like the bravado, like, I don't really want to buy this, buying it because, you know, it's what she wants and blah, 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 you know, and they're like really, like, put out about having to spend some money. <laughs> and uh, you think, well, just don't do it then, you know. We'll um, married, then. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's not a great, and I don't know whether it's bravado and they're just like, you know, trying to, you know, I don't know, have a bit of a laugh or something. Most of them, they're like, they're serious. And you're like, mm. don't buy it then. Well, the a big change in regards to that is the guys that come in now are really serious. Like they know that they want to get engaged to their partner, like really serious. And that's like so nice to see. I'd prefer to see one person who really wants to get married as opposed to 10 people that just can't really be bothered because I just think like, this is like, this is your life, it's a lifetime commitment you're supposed to be making mm. and you're like pretty flippant i think that's another thing about marriages now like people aren't so flippant about it like society's changed you go back 30 40 years and uh, if you weren't married by the time you were 20 you were like well maybe not 40 years but it was like the thing you do you like you leave school you get married you have kids you buy a house and then you just wait to die mm. that's it mm. now like I'm 37, you know, I've never been engaged, never been married, nothing like that. And that's not because I don't believe in it or I don't want to. It's just that I think you should do it when the time is right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you talk about an engagement ring being expensive, getting married is way more expensive and getting divorced is even more expensive. So you should definitely make sure you want to get engaged. And that's why like half the guys that have come in and I'm like, oh, we don't want to get this. It's like, well, they're probably divorced now, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, true. All right. So I guess on that note of budget and stuff, obviously an option for, for people buying diamonds now are lab room diamonds versus real diamonds. Mm. So explain the difference. I mean, is it is it a real diamonds worth the money and are lab diamonds real diamonds also? Yeah. Uh, so 
let me explain what a lab grown diamond is. Mm. So you test the material, it is diamond. Okay. So if you got like the, if I could write the chemical makeup of it down, they would both be exactly the same. The difference is one's made in a factory and one has been buried in the earth. You know, they were formed at least 3 billion years ago. Um, so a lab grown diamond is a diamond, mm. but the way it's been created is very, very different to an actual diamond. Okay. For me, I just like the idea of owning a bit of history. Owning something yeah. that's fucking old. That's the difference what? for me right there. What, for a diamond? Yeah. If I was going to buy a diamond, I'd want something that was three billion years old. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then the way that they're mined. Yeah. There's all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th this is, so this is, uh, so what you're getting at is how lab grown diamonds have been marketed to the consumer. They're marketed that they're super ethical, mm -hmm. they're green and they're sustainable. Okay. So calling it a lab grown diamond already. So what do you think about when someone says the word lab or laboratory? clean white coats yeah. sterile yeah they're not they're, they're, they're grown in massive factories uh, and about i think with the latest numbers i could find about 90 percent are made in china and india mm. they use predominantly coal and it it uses a tremendous amount of energy to create these artificial diamonds uh, the numbers were as much as 750 kilowatt hours of coal energy to produce a one carat lab grown diamond compared with, um, I think it was 36 kilowatt hours for a mined diamond. Okay, we'll get onto the ethics yeah. in a minute. A lab grown diamond requires, so we just talked about the energy it requires, which is predominantly the my coal. It requires typically a, a seed crystal to start the process, which is a mined diamond anyway. It then requires other minerals are mined. One of them is cobalt. And I know you spoke about cobalt before. Well, they need it for, to grow. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like a, a chemical yeah. soup that they need. Another one is methane. Well, they need a carbon containing gas. Uh, the, the easiest one for them to use is methane, apparently, from what I can see, which is a byproduct of fossil fuels so if you're comparing them on a green for green basis you could arguably say that just going from energy expenditure wise a natural diamond is better by a factor of 20 it uses 20 times less energy to produce one carrot what to the environment yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's better for the environment yeah. yeah. You need to explain to me how you grow a diamond because yeah, it's mad. I didn't really. Yeah. Is it is it a really good bit of science though to to grow them? Because it seems yeah. to me like it's fucking clever stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's <laughs> yeah. like what? grow a diamond out of yeah. Like, whatever. Yeah, we're not it's talking like, a plant here. Like, how, how do you? It's like a stone, right? So how do you grow a stone? You're gonna have yeah. to explain that. If you okay, can. so there's two ways they can do it. One um, is it's it's been around for decades. So NASA actually invented the technology. So where'd you say that? I was just thinking, one of them makes fucking spaceships out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah well, like it was, so, so um, the, there's two types. There's high pressure, high temperature, and there's carbon vapor deposit. So CVD is what NASA invented to coat moving parts in space shuttles so that they didn't wear out when you're in space because mm -hmm. you yeah. can't just switch stuff around in space, I guess. Yeah. Bit of an issue. That technology has been around for decades and decades and decades. So is the high pressure, high temperature. So... They both essentially do the same thing, right? Uh, they're, they're put in a vessel, you put in the chemical soup, and then they're put under um, masses of pressure to kind of recreate the environment that created them when they're in the earth. Um, and then they stay in that state for, uh, you know, I think as long as two or three weeks. Um, the high pressure, high temperature uh, wouldn't really yield very good high quality results so a lot of people move to cbd now um and that is i can't remember how the technology works but it basically like blasts the carbon containing gas with, with like a plasma ray or something to break the carbon out of it and then all the other chemicals and everything um uh make it like 
stick to each other and it starts going in layers. It's similar to how 3D printing works, as far as I can tell. So that it builds up the diamond in layers. So it's so fucking clever. Mm. Yeah, it is clever. Really yeah, clever. it's really clever. One of the big reasons why it's been pushed into the you know, the, the world of jewellery and the consumer is because it's um, the technology is really good now. It's so good. It's affordable mm. and cheap yeah. to make them. You know, you, you still got to think about the majority of mines diamonds, over 70% are used for industrial purposes. The same with lab grown. The overwhelming majority of lab grown diamonds are used for industrial purposes. So like this is um, being pushed into the market because people are like, well, it's a, a good alternative to an actual diamond. Mm. And, and I just wanted to ask as well, and this may be something I should have asked earlier, but when when it comes out, so I guess both the ground or wherever they get real ones from and yeah. the lab ones, what do they look like? Because you have to cut them and, and shape them, is that right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so what's that process? I don't know what they look like when they come out of uh, um, one of these vessels yeah. for uh, factory or synthetic diamonds. Mm. When they come out of the ground, they're basically two pyramid shapes stuck bottom to bottom. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's called a dodecahedron. And then what they do is they have to cut that down through those two bases so that you split it and you've got two roughly looking diamond shapes. Firstly, they'll look at what's the biggest round diamond they can get out of these rough pieces. And then uh, that splitting process, I went to a, a, a cutting factory mm. to see how they do that and they have these like rows of machines set up that are going 24 7 a day diamond tip blades diamond powder being poured in as lubricant and they go through a millimeter an hour so like what? yeah it's, it's like this is the thing you know you said just uh, sorry you said just now about you want a piece of history you want to, mm. there's nothing else on the planet which is like a diamond mm. nothing at all so yeah, they cut them through, they split them, and they do this process called bruting, where they start chipping the edges off, and slowly they get it to be, you know, round and fashioned into the the shape you see today. And that cut's changed over many years as they've perfected what gives it the most, you know, the most sparkle, the best optical properties. Yeah, because that's what I was going to say. When you think about a diamond, it is it's the it's that distinct shape, isn't it, that gives it yeah. the sparkle. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. yeah. And then when you mentioned about the use it use it in sort of um, you know other than jewelry, use it in the manufacturing and that sort mm. of stuff. What would the purpose of that be? Is it for sort of cutting and that type of thing you just said? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the time, what are they? And this is another thing about when people say diamonds aren't rare. Okay, like diamonds aren't really rare, but I always make the analogy with cars. Like, are cars rare? No. See them all the time, right? And find them, you know, well, you can't find diamonds anywhere, but cars are not rare, right? Mm. How rare are Bugatti Veyrons? Very. Very, okay. So there is a sliding scale. The industrial ones are not gem quality and they're like, you know, in the overwhelming majority, you know, th throughout the planet, they find more and more and more and they'll probably continue to find more. So the minority becomes gem quality stones, which then goes into the jewellery, etc. All the industrial stuff usually gets ground up, turned into pastes um, and then maybe stuck to drill bits, things like that. Because the other thing about lab grown diamonds, about them, not being the same as a natural diamond. Industry has known this for years. And this is why industrial diamond or, you know, natural mining or traditional mining is still being used to get natural diamonds. The synthetic way of doing it produces quite brittle material. So the like the the mined diamonds, the way they say they put them on a drill tip or something, they're still much harder. Whereas if they synthetically bond um, synthetic diamond to a drill tip that probably just won't last as long because it will start to chip off mm. and uh, so th this is why then you know for me like natural diamond mining this isn't going away if you like if you just eradicated all of the jewelry aspect for natural diamonds it's still going to be there the people are still going to need it mm. okay great so we were talking ethics i think yeah so ethics the big question is can you buy an ethical diamond? Um, the answer is yes, you definitely can. And it'd be a lot easier than you think. The easiest way to do it is just buy a diamond from Canada. You used to be able to buy them from Australia, but there's a, a very popular mine there that's just closed. You can buy one, again, the overwhelming 
amount of diamonds come from Russia. For some reason, De Beers in particular, I've got this bad rep. In the 90s, before where the term conflict diamond originated, they ceased doing trading with other people outside of their own supply chain so that they could 100% guarantee that consumers would be receiving 100% conflict-free natural diamond. For some reason, that hasn't been marketed very well at all. So De Beers don't just sell. So De Beers, the mining company, and De Beers, where you can go online and buy jewelry from them, they're separate companies. De Beers will sell off you know, their um, material they find in their mines to all different suppliers. You know, I can buy it. Lots of people, different people can buy it. Everybody's real concern is the conflict diamond thing. And that definitely was a big concern uh, in the middle of the 90s. There was really big, con- well, the film Blood Diamond is what probably mm. what brought it to everybody's mind. I, I, I was about. literally going to say, I watch Blood Diamond. When I when I see diamonds, that's all I think about. Yeah. It's, it's something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah, was definitely, a, definitely an issue. So there is a conflict in Sierra Leone and there are diamond mines in Sierra Leone. De Beers don't have a diamond mine in Sierra Leone, but um, they, uh, you know, a conflict diamond is referred to as any diamond which is bought or sold, which then goes towards the funding of an ongoing war, essentially like bioweapons or something like that, right? Obviously that was a problem because it was helping to protect them <laughs> perpetuate the war you know yeah. ongoing it wasn't helping it stop or anything so there was an answer to that the diamond industry had to protect itself essentially you know like like any industry if it comes under the fire you've you've got to you've got to change the consumer demands their change as uh not not just the beers just the whole diamond industry uh in particular had something set up which isn't it's still current today called the Kimberley process. The Kimberley process started in 2003 uh, under a UN mandate. It's got 85 participating countries and it basically set to remove all conflict diamonds from the global supply, supply chain. So what we know where 20 years on from that, the latest numbers show that they're removing 99.8% of all conflict diamonds. Now, conflict diamonds weren't aren't now as much of a big an issue as they were then. Huge reason is because of the Kimberley process. Something else the Kimberley process enforces is heavy regulation. So if you come and buy a diamond from me, I have to be able to trace that back through the entire supply chain to the mine that it came from. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So if someone coming in with diamonds into your shop, you'd have to prove where they've come from. What, if a customer come in? Yeah. Some no, we don't, we don't have to do that. They do. So whoever they've bought the diamond from has to do that. So if I sell you a diamond or if I have a diamond... Yeah, um, so, I'm going to say sell. someone comes in and say, I have three diamonds and I come in and sell them to you. Yeah. You, you buy them off me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I see what you mean. How do you know we me? then... Yeah, how, do they, how, how would you then know? Yeah, so antique jewellery is a big thing with this. Mm-hmm. And there is no real regulation surrounding that. You can, some people can look at a diamond, uh, it's in inclusions or whatever, and they can maybe work out what mine it came from. But there's no regulation for diamonds that are already in the Sorry, supply can. chain. Yeah. yeah. So typically, if it was bought, I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't even know how to get a conflict diamond other than I was going to fly to Sierra Leone myself and go to one of the, you know, uh, mines that's under like some militant group's control and then buy one from them, you know? But if, are they still doing that sort of thing? I imagine they are. So where are they selling it to if it's not allowed? So you're talking about the point two percent Yeah, like I'm just, yeah, just in general, if there's, if there's still a, if they're still doing it, then there must be, they must be selling it to someone. Yeah, I guess it's probably a black market for that sort of thing still as there is. Many well, things, I guess, right? I don't yeah. Know. Like, let's face it, the number is never going to be zero. Oh, no, never. But the overwhelming likelihood that you're going to buy a diamond which has come from a, you know, funding some sort of conflict is basically zero. I mean, it's already 99%, 99.8% likely mm. that you're not going to be buying a conflict diamond. 
Yeah. If you then factor in the fact that it's way more likely that you'll be getting a diamond from Russia anyway, just just from a numbers game, like how likely is it? I mean, it's it's something which, yes, has you know needs to be addressed. It has been addressed. And again, but if all if all these you know things and practices are in place to protect the consumer as well as protecting uh, you know the communities and and uh, you know countries in Africa, mm. if you you know if you're still really really worried about ethics, like I said, buy one from Canada. Why Canada so uh, so ethical? It's full of Canadians. <laughs> anyway, well, this is the thing. So, yeah. but this is the thing. You know, you buy a diamond from Canada, you buy one from Australia, you buy one mm. from South Africa. Like so, just being so basically, the miners are getting paid a fair amount of money. Yeah, they're not. They're not. Forced well, no, no. So even in Africa, they're getting paid a fair amount of money. I mean, you, there's something called Botswana's success story. The beers have this mine in Botswana, and they pay everyone a fair wage. The amount of jobs that has been created. They've built hospitals. I think the number before that mine success of doctors to people was like one in. I don't know, 200, something like that. Now it's like one in 30. They've built entire road networks. De Beers closed their London sorting office and moved it to um, Africa. I'm not sure where it was. I'm not sure if it was in Botswana. But anyway, they moved it so that they could create more jobs for uh, people living in, you know, these typically deprived areas. You know, you, you ethically, everyone's getting paid well. Are they getting paid well, though, or are they just getting paid more than... And fuck all if that makes sense like yeah it does make sense know, to like, be honest like it's, it's fine going yeah they you know they're paid and we get roads and doctors and stuff but they're still profiting fucking massively off those people I imagine. oh yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean like i don't know the answer to with you know some canadian guy is getting paid the same as yeah, that's, what, that's what i'm saying yeah yeah don't know it's interesting isn't it? and I it's good it's, good it's, question. A, it's the same as the cobalt stuff isn't it it's mm. like everyone we all need fucking phones and we all need this yeah yeah but how that's mined now is a huge thing isn't it no, yeah, it's, it's the same sort of thing as diamonds. Really, none of us need a fucking diamond ring. Yeah, I totally agree. Really, none of us need it, mm. but it's nice to have. And like you said, it's a really cool piece of history, and it, mm. they're fucking amazing things. So yeah. we want them just through desire. Yeah, but we don't really need them. And I think the only time I ever get a bit like, eh, you know, is about people suffering for us to have a, a ring on our finger. Yeah, that's my, it. That's it. That's it. My personal opinion is though is uh, you've picked the wrong hill to die on if you are worried about ethics and diamonds. Because like you say, like yeah, 100%. heavily regulated industry now, there's been a huge response. You know, if we're having this conversation in the 70s, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, that's probably a bit great. <laughs> you know? But there's been an industry response. Everything's leveled up and uh, it's much, much better than it was. Yeah. There's lots of other things going on in the world that, Oh mate, the world's cheap clothing, fucked, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, like cheap, like the cobalt mining thing. It's like, why is no one really talking about that? Why are people still using that same old trope that diamonds are unethical when there's been so much done and there's been nothing done about all these different aspects of trade and manufacture? Mm. Yeah, could I agree more? So I mentioned that obviously lab grown diamonds are cheaper and we kind of can understand why now. What is the price difference? How much cheaper are they? Yeah, quite a lot cheaper. So size for size so if you get a yeah. one carat lab grown diamond you can you can get one of those depending on where you get it from for about fifteen hundred dollars okay. like for like quality that could be as much as six thousand dollars for a one carat again okay. fluctuates slightly with colors cool. so they are that's huge isn't it yeah it's they're a huge difference yeah, huh? yeah they're, they're really cheap in comparison for me that's the only yeah. benefit you know so how does that affect your market as in when you're selling diamonds do people come in and and haggle price or you know do they do they want lab grown yeah, well, this, this yeah. is what I was thinking because you know can my missus if I were to buy one could she even tell like, the difference if no it, no okay. so this is this is the whole word play which is around this is another like mm. um, claim that people who will say you're a lab grown diamond make so it's word play so what they do is they say you can't tell the difference mm. okay so you know what I was saying just now molecular structure made of the same stuff it's exactly the same mm. right they're marketed and sold that there is no difference but ironically we're having a conversation about two different things mm. we're having a conversation about natural diamonds and synthetic diamonds they have to be sold as different things because they're not the same legally they have to be sold as different things 
if you come in and say you want a lab grown diamond, absolutely fine. I'll sell you one. A lot of people say that they want it because of the green side of it or the ethical side of it, etc. Okay. I'll have a conversation with someone about that so they really understand what they're buying. All right. Sometimes they still choose still still choose the lab grown because they mm. want a bigger stone for less money. Mm. Great. Fair enough. Fine. You know, so like I said before, there is a market for it. You know, it's the same as, um, you know, a, a fake Rolex is the same as a real Rolex, but it's not the same, is it? They look the same. They're stainless steel, for example, if that's the version you've bought. You test them the same. They do the same function. The weight difference, though. <laughs> no, they still weigh the same. <laughs> do they? Yeah, yeah. Like nice. the, the, the copies now are so good. Really? Yeah, yeah. You, like, have to take them apart and, you know, yeah, work out. Them, yeah. yeah, yeah. But... I'd never wear a fake Rolex, you know, because I know it's not mm. the real deal. So, but I guess because you're buying it for someone else, it's like if you didn't know it was a fake Rolex, you'd wear it, right? Unknowingly. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's your ethical like, <laughs> <laughs> conversation all over again. Isn't it? And you know, that's the thing is, is uh, you have a moral obligation, yeah. you know. Do you uh, have to, sorry, do you have to, when you're um, displaying a ring, do you have to say whether it's a real diamond or a lab grown diamond so you, have to, you have to declare if it's lab grown you have to yeah yeah. so that's what I was going to ask because yeah. you know these uh, again high street chains that have got loads of rings they could have all lab grown diamonds in them and just be selling them as yeah. diamonds I imagine yeah yeah and this, this is so this is a bit of a problem there's like unscrupulous people out there that will try and sell you a lab grown diamond as a mm. real diamond have you ever had instances where they come into the shop thinking it's a real diamond? You <laughs> yeah. got to sell it, and it's you're like, Some mate, that's worth to sell her. Yeah, yeah, ring yeah. Ring. and it's like uh, that's a lab grown. That's worth fuck all. Yeah. So how can have you, you had that? So yep. How so? How yeah, can no. you tell? Okay, so lots of different ways to tell. So okay, if I uh, <laughs> if um, by eye I can't tell, mm. right? Now legally they've all got to be laser inscribed on the edge of the stone that they're lab grown. Okay, so there's one way really easily that you can tell by eye, okay? The the way they're sold is that they're exactly the same, can't tell the difference, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So you go, oh, why would I spend all that money on a natural one? Because, you know, there is no difference. Mm. The truth is, is they're leaving out a huge part of how you can actually tell whether something's lab-grown diamond or not. So we need to digress a little bit again. Tell me if, tell me if you're going to get overwhelmed. <laughs> Short story is, is there's different types of diamond. The only ones where you need to be concerned about now is type 1A and type 2A. 100% of natural diamonds are type 1A. I think 98%, sorry, 2% of natural diamonds are type 2A, okay? 100% of lab-grown diamonds are type 2A. So you basically get a machine like this, you ready? Yeah, it works out. And hang on, I don't want to bang the microphone. So you essentially get a machine or a piece of testing equipment. What's it called? Gem pen. So this is called a gem pen. Um, they essentially all work the same way. So what this is, is this will send shortwave UV light out into a stone you've got to do it in a really dark room um and then what happens is you get a result that looks like one of these things so you see all those different colors mm -hmm. what that does is it tells you whether it's a type 1a or a type 2a diamond okay so already we can tell that if it shows up with a type 2a result it could be it's two percent likely that is natural, all right? So that is a test that takes maybe 30 seconds, a minute, okay? And then if you get that result, I mean, it's already overwhelming likely that you've got a lab-grown diamond. This pen in particular will tell you 100% because of the, the book I showed you. It will show even how it's been made, whether it's high pressure, high temperature, or whether it's carbon vapor deposit, okay? It's got these different filters and this will measure for something called phosphorescence as well. Um, and basically what it means is the stone will glow and then when you turn off the, the irradiation, the stone will continue to glow and it will dissipate slowly. Now, if that happens, you 100% have a 
lacquer and diamond. It's a it's a strange thing because nobody knows why a diamond fluoresces and why a natural diamond fluoresces or what causes a lab-grown diamond to fluoresce. But lab-grown diamonds do it in an extremely different way. So the technology surrounding how to get that out of a diamond, so, you, so then you can't tell that way, um, I don't really know where they'd start with that. Mm. Even if you bypass that, I mean, so say if we got a positive hit for a lab-grown diamond, we would send it to a lab who would then look at something called its, uh, its striations. And that means how the diamond's grown. So a natural diamond under the ground doesn't grow in two or three weeks like these fake ones do. They'll grow over a big, really, really long period of time because it'll be times of high pressure, high temperature, that will slowly fade away and then it will increase again um, and you know the picture I showed you earlier, the, the little black dots. So what actually happens is often those would be other gemstones that are present in the area when the diamond's growing and the diamond grows around it. Right. Because they grow at different speeds at different times, you can, you know, imagine a growth striation, which is, you know, imagine if a tree grew at exactly the same speed all its life. You'd have perfect rings, but you don't. You have these wiggles, don't you, where it's grown quick one year, short another year, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a inherent characteristic of a natural diamond. Lab-grown diamonds, obviously, they don't have that. Mm. Their striations look incredibly different. So people saying that there is no difference is just, it's a, you know, or that you can't tell the difference, it's a blatant lie. And in this documentary um, that was on recently, which was very, very... What was the documentary called? Yeah. Nothing lasts forever. It was very pro lab grown diamonds. It didn't mention any of this. Mm. It basically said, you know, they're the same. That's the end of the story. They're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can li like this here. So this takes a little bit more knowledge to know how to use and to interpret the results. There's literally a machine that you can get, which is about a quarter of the price of this, which you just put the diamond on it and it will flash up type 1A, type 2A. That easy. That easy. And is that fast. Okay. And are they quite popular, the lab group diamonds you find? They're, depending on where you look, they're between 10 and 18% of engagement ring sales for the okay. last couple of years. So they're getting more popular. They, they, they're, they are, they're, Do you uh, think they'll take over eventually? No. Never? No. And the reason why I don't think they'll take over is because if you go back even three years, the price was really high for lab grown diamonds. Okay, it's much, much higher than it was now. So it used to be about $7,000 or as much as $7,000 a carat. As I said just now, that is now $1,500 a carat. This is another part of the conversation that we have with people when they come and ask for a lab grown diamond. Because again, average spend could be two grand. You spend two grand on an actual diamond, 10 years time, whatever, you know, it's still gonna be worth something. You spend two grand on a lab-grown diamond, factory diamond, you should call them that. Uh, you know, chances are it's already worthless. Is that just because of the mass production of them? You can make more of them, yeah. You can just make more of them. Yeah. Which you can't do with a natural diamond. Mm. You can obviously mine more of a natural diamond, but there's still a finite amount of them, and they're still rare. Yeah. It's still different like... Cuts, different cuts, Oh, yeah, it's different. it's still a just it's just a very very different product. There's a place in the market for them because so I've seen this all before as well. Like I said, I've been around quite a while, right? So this whole thing with this synthetic diamond, the whole marketing strategy is a carbon copy of what they did with something called moissanite. So moissanite is uh, a diamond simulant. Okay, so it's not. So if you looked at the the you know the structure, the chemical molecular structure. It's not diamond, okay? It's a different material, but that material's optical properties and hardness are very, very similar to a diamond. It's also synthetically made. Go back towards the end of the 80s, um, early 90s. Again, really, really old technology, made in the 50s. They started pushing it into the jewelry market and they pushed it in by saying, can't tell the difference, it's green. It's ethical, 
It's exactly the same process. And it's cheaper than diamond. Now, we've almost seen a very, almost the carbon copy in the pricing structure as well, where they came out and they were priced like fairly high. Now they're just worthless. Like literally worthless. <laughs> you can still buy them. Mm -hmm. But the good but, thing about <clears throat> these simulants is that you, you must have heard of cubic zirconia. No, uh, about a cubic Yeah. It's, um, it's like a very soft, like the, it's a, a really early diamond simulant. You know, the problem with it is, you know, say if you want to get engaged, you don't have a lot of money, it's very cheap, yeah? The problem with it is, is you have it for a few years and because it's, it's like not hard, you chip it, it breaks, you know, even dust can scratch them, you end up losing its luster and its brilliance, right? So if you're someone that wants to get engaged, but you don't have a lot of money and you, you know, you still want to go through that process, you can buy a lab-grown diamond for a lot less money, but that will still look great in, you know, 50 years' time because of its properties that are equal to a diamond. Like, it's hard, its brilliance will shine, it will never lose its luster. So they're, they're great for that. And I think all that's going to happen is a lab-grown diamond will just take over the diamond simulant industry. Because the thing is, I mean, like... I don't, I don't think they'll ever let... The, whoever is above, you know, the rich will never let people um, get rid of diamonds because they probably own too many of them. You know, with people in high places, you know, they've probably got millions and millions and billions of pounds worth of, of diamonds and gold, especially lying yeah. around. So it's always going to keep its value because people that control the world yeah. probably invest a lot into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to mention that as well because there's a big misconception that uh, De Beers control the diamond market they're not even close to being the biggest player when it comes to the diamond world so let's see if i can do this by memory so top four in at number four is De Beers, 3.6 billion the next is al rosa i think they were 4.5 billion uh, i can't remember the next two but number one is someone called anglo-american and they're 515 billion billion what pounds that's what that's our company's net worth mm -hmm. and they're in the same business as the beers so yeah so it's never gonna it's never gonna it, it, that's what i mean the, the companies like that do not um industry is such a big player in the diamond world and diamond mining because like i say 70 percent of it so when they're worth that much are they is that because they're hoarding diamonds or is it because that they're selling that money if that makes sense. was it if they're if you don't even know who they are if they're not massive players then what yeah. the fuck are they doing with all these, well, all these diamonds, you know? Yeah, well, technically, Angle American is um, like a conglomerate. Right. And they own lots of different diamond yeah. subsidiaries. But, uh, yeah, some of that will be luxury diamonds. Some of it will be for industry. Um, and just think, uh, it's like a... I mean, really, if you think about sustainability, you buy a diamond engagement ring, you should only really be buying one, right? It's not another... It's not another what's, the, what's the divorce rates now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you just, just, just get it polished, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. You just say, recycle. I'll take that yeah. back. <laughs> How sustainable is that? Uh, I'd rather not get divorced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, you know, you could argue that it's like, you know, a sustainable product in that way. Yeah. But the industry side of diamonds is um, it's very cyclical. Obviously, there's always going to be new drill bits made. There's always going to be new, you know, fill in the blank of what needs to be diamond tipped or coated. So... There's diamonds, sorry, the other little thing that just popped in my you saying that. Um, there's... Diamond value change like gold. Yeah, I mean, you can invest in gold, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Can you invest in diamond, or can you? Can yes, you, know you can. I mean? Yeah, you can. So yeah. it's it doesn't move the same as no. um, say gold does, or whatever. Because it's not really, it's not tied as much to currency yeah. or like world because there's a set gold value, isn't there? So if you go, the, and, yeah, if you go and trade price. in like a coin, for example, it, yeah. it's worth that much mm. because it's that much gold. Is yeah. it the same type of thing with the diamond? No. So it's on your discretion of clarity, of size, and of quality. Yeah, I guess there it's, is, um, it's fucking mental, isn't it? Yeah, the it's crazy, so. Isn't it? so there's a guide. Uh, it's called um, the Rappaport price list. Okay, so all diamonds in the world are referenced against that pricing guide, depending on their cup, clarity, okay. et cetera, et cetera, right? That, is, um, that changes through different reasons, mostly because of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Now, during COVID, you, we saw a huge spike in, um, it's called melee, like lots of tiny stones that you'll put in um, jewellery. The price of that went through the roof because 
a lot of places shut down that was doing the cutting. So then, you know, and polishing. So then as a result of that, demand increased. It's mainly just affected by supply and demand. Yeah. You can buy a certain, like diamond, for example, yeah. and then, you know, in the future, you sell it for more. Right. It's not It's not an easy thing to do, but you will always have some value. Mm. Is there like a, like a world famous diamond, like a piece or a stone that's like known to be the best, most expensive diamond ever? Is there, is there a diamond goat? <laughs> a diamond well, goat. <laughs> the, the, the Cullinan one is in the, um, the crown. Okay. In the UK. What's the value of that? Approximately. Priceless. Okay. Yeah, priceless. I mean, you, quite often you'll see, I mean, I had a friend that worked at um, Graf. Have you ever heard of Graf? No. Super high-end luxury diamond um, jeweler. Um, and uh, he would be sending me pictures of the stuff that he would do. And he would, you know, he'd, he'd be making like a bracelet, which I'd like, you know, 21 carat diamonds in. And like, you know, we might not even sell that in a year, you know, like individual like mm. rings. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like that's, that's huge. And he was like, oh yeah, I've got 15 of these to do. And you're like, <laughs> and then he would send me pictures of diamonds that I like, like this big, you know, and they're just getting made into pendants or whatever. Mm. Like there's a whole world out there to do with, you know, super high end luxury diamonds that mm. a lot of them um, are sold and they're never disclosed mm. how much they've been bought for. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But yeah, if you're asking for the goat of diamonds, it's got to be the one that's in the crown, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, is, is the diamond the most expensive stone you can buy? Yeah. So a while ago, the most expensive stone ever bought per carat and a carat price mm. was a ruby. Okay. Yeah, but typically, like, diamonds are going to be the most expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, I've got, got another question, actually, just come to me. Um, where does the, this whole idea of buying an engagement ring and giving an engagement ring, where does, where, where does the history of that come from? Where did that start? So, first record of ring giving mm. was the Egyptians. They were made out of hemp or other um, fairly perishable materials. Fast forward to bit more sinister times during the Roman period and um, wives would often be given rings to attach to keys to signify ownership, you know, that they were married to someone. Um, but the first documented diamond engagement ring was in 1477. And it's, um, it's quite a popular story because there's a bit of controversy surrounding it, which, you know, people will tell it about because people love dragging down the diamond industry and they uh, you know I think it's just an easy target for people again going back to this documentary um, nothing lasts forever there is someone on it that makes a claim in reference to this story and it is just fully inaccurate so if I just go through the the history the first mm. engagement ring we can take it from there so it's the first recorded history of, of a diamond engagement ring being given there's hints to it previous to this, but this is the first recorded instance. So in 1477, there was this guy called Archduke uh, Maximilian III or something like that. And he commissioned the first diamond engagement ring to give to Mary of Burgundy, okay? In the documentary, they say that the story was, it was a business deal, it was all part of this big massive land grab on the Archduke Maximilian's side and that the diamond ring actually went to Mary, Mary Burgundy's father okay so I thought I'd just look into this because it's, it's a pretty big claim and I thought yeah maybe that could just ruin the whole cultural and sentimental aspect of giving someone a diamond ring it's actually really easy to find out this I couldn't find anything in relation to this land grab story and everything but what I did find is that Mary of Burgundy inherited all of her father's land in January 1477 because he was killed by the French whilst he was warring, trying to protect his domain. Archduke Maximilian and Mary of Burgundy got married in August 1477. So apparently, according to the documentary, the engagement got given to a dead guy. <laughs> like, to me, it's absolutely insane that something will go out on a platform as big as Netflix and 
it's like it's just full of inaccuracies and full of lies. And that is just like the most insanely blatant one. And it's like not even really relevant to the diamond industry at all. But what was the, the narrative from their end to tell that story? They want to just tear down its sentimental value and say that um, it, it's just worthless. It's what the, diamonds are worth. Diamonds are worthless, yeah. And that like the, the whole, you know, uh, origin is founded on fallacy. Right. A lot of people as well commonly um, believe that De Beers invented the engagement ring. They didn't. Obviously, the Archduke Maximilian invented the diamond engagement ring mm -hmm. and gave it to a dead guy. All De Beers did is they ran a very, very successful advertising campaign mm -hmm. saying, if you're going to buy a diamond engagement ring, make it a De Beers ring. Mm -hmm. And it was like the diamonds last for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. You find that so much, don't you? The propaganda films like that. Same with all the vegan ones, all the fucking bullshit. That Game changes. Made, yeah, yeah. yeah. Game the thing is, it's... it's totally like. me vegan, that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a strict carnivore now. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's like, you know, they just make these claims and people just go, oh, yeah. Well, mate, it's no like, it's like anything. It. Fuck me, we're in the fitness industry. Everything we hear is bullshit. Mm. You know, yeah. Most of it is bullshit, isn't it? Mm. You know, when you sit there, you just think, fucking yeah. shut up, man. Yeah, yeah. It's everything, but like the whole doc the documentary just full of it. And it's so disappointing because we like, we as like retailers, people come in and we have to defend against that. And they're it's like, it's a narrative that they create. And it's, they're, you know, they're obviously backed from people that are growing lab diamonds. Mm. And then they yeah. create a narrative around that and they push their side of it. And to be honest, I've tried to be as impartial mm -hmm. as I can be about this because. I'll sell you a natural diamond or I'll sell you a labyrinth diamond, but I'll only sell you if you understand what you're buying. Yeah. You know, if you come and say to me, is a natural diamond ethical? I'll go through the Kimberley process and I'll explain that it's not 0%, mm. but it's extremely likely that it's going to be gone through the correct supply chain. Mm -hmm. And if you're asking me about a labyrinth diamond, I'll give you all the facts and information there. And it's up to you to make the decision. But it's not right that you would come in to me and say, oh, there's, here's this natural diamond and here's this lab-grown diamond. Oh, you can't tell the difference. but Because the thing is, in actual fact, if I was really concerned with making loads of money and making as much profit as I could, mm. I would be pushing the lab-grown diamond to you because the percentage profit in a lab-grown diamond is in the hundreds. Yes. In the hundreds, mate. It's yeah. crazy. So I tried to work out roughly how much it would cost to produce one and it's about $150 to produce a one-carat one. And they're being sold at fifteen hundred dollars a carat. People talk about price setting. You know, people talk about the price of natural diamonds is made up. The price of lab grown diamonds is literally made up. Mm. Like yeah. literally yeah. made up. Because they can they can make as many as they want as well. Yeah. The price would just continue to fall. Sounds like banknotes, mate. I was about to say it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's, yeah. it's inflation, isn't it? Yeah, it's like yeah. You know, diamond inflation, mate, you knew. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. yeah, mate, that was brilliant. Thanks for coming on, mate. Very insightful, and I uh, feel less uh, less overwhelmed now. Thank yeah, you great. Much. Yeah, thank <laughs> you very much. cheers, Rob. Thank you, mate.